Sokala Duma Radio. And we are live. Hello and welcome to Sokola Duma Radio, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nkulule Konkeo. I'm your host. I have three special guests today as we dissect the upcoming fixtures and some more football things that are happening at the moment. Um, I have coach, uh, four-time PSL winning coach, Gordon Egerson. Coach, hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Thank yeah. you very much for being here. We also had Rodney. Also have Rodney Reiners, who's part of the Sokola Duma family. Um, Rodney, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Yeah, nice to have you uh, in the house for the very, very, very first time. And we also have uh, Shapa Clint, uh, the cow editor. Uh, he mm -hmm. was a journalist at some point and an editor at Sokola Duma. He's part of the furniture at Sokola Duma. Clint, thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing? Thanks, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Exciting. Yeah, yeah, man. All right. If you're wondering why we're having this conversation, Sokola Duma Radio, you would know as a podcast. Um, we have podcasts on the Sokola Duma website, which are downloaded by yourselves. Uh, a lot of you are our fans, uh, loyal fans. We now uh, are launching live. We are now live, but this podcast will also be available for you to download after this conversation. Uh, well, we have, gentlemen, we have a lot to dissect in the hour. The stream will start from 2 and uh, it will end uh, and at exactly an hour from 2 at 3 p.m. Gentlemen, we have a lot to dissect. Uh, there's a big game this upcoming weekend. Uh, there's Mamelodi Sundowns playing host to uh, eight-time Kev Champions League winners. Al Akhli. It's a huge game for Mamelodi Sundowns. A game which Coach Pito Musimane said uh, is going to be a major one. Uh, it will prove that... Uh, Al Ahli are the big dogs of African football. Coach, before we get into that, uh, let's get an update from you. You are four-time Absa Premiership winner. Uh, a lot of people have asked uh, what happened to you. Uh, just give us an update as to what are you currently doing at the moment. Well, you know, uh, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm still involved in football. Mm. I've started my own academy called Hamilton's Football Academy. And my plan is to start from the bottom, get my development program in place, and then maybe eventually get into back into the Premier League by uh, buying a team or buying a, a, a franchise of a National First Division team or a uh, ABC Metepe League mm. and try and get to back into, into that. Yeah. I mean, you still are involved in football um, with what you're explaining now. Uh, are you then confirming that you would be moving to the back office or are you still considering yourself as a manager if one day you go back to the Absa Premiership? No, I'm still obviously very much involved. You know, I'm still fit and strong, uh, strong thank God. And, uh, you know, I'm, I still love the game. I enjoy it. And, you know, it's very hard to stop. You know, when you feel you still got lots to offer, then you don't want to stop. You know, when the time comes, when I wake up in the morning, I say to myself, oh, I've got to go to training now. That's the time I'm going to stop. But I can't wait to wake up and go out on the field and train and, and do my thing and I'm enjoying it. Mm, all right, I'll be silly and ask you, how many league titles do you still think you have in your body? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I look at it today and I say to myself, you know what, if I was coaching that team, I think I could win the championship. And I keep thinking like that because, you know, it's a magnificent feeling. Once you won one, you only win two. And when you win two, you only win three. And I've won four and uh, still th often think about winning the fifth one, you know, just to see which team it's going to be with, maybe uh, Hamilton's. I believe you, Coach. Four uh, absolute premiership titles with four different teams. That's historic. That's the record. Now, uh, a meta on the table is Mamadou de Sundowns hosting CAF Champions League eight-time winners. Uh, actually, gentlemen, let's talk about that. Rodney, um, what do you make of that game? Um, which team do you think is the strongest coming to that game? Well, I think because Sundowns have the home advantage, that's going to be extremely important for them. Um, I think Gordon was talking about a little bit earlier off-air um, that Al Akhli are extremely good uh, back in, in, in Cairo. So it's important, I think, that Sundowns um, win it at home at uh, Lucas Moripe. And then they've got a, a good uh, buffer to take to them when they go back to Cairo. Sure. I mean, Clint, you we mentioned the fact that um, Pizzo Musuman has mentioned that they are small boys, that is Mamelodi Sundowns, in comparison to um, Al Akhli. Is that mind games? Does he genuinely believe that they're small boys and perhaps means that he won't get past this quarterfinal? Hmm. Look, uh, in terms of pedigree in this um, competition, I think he's, he's maybe got a point because they've, they've won it as eight or nine times, going for nine times now, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So they've got the stars in their jersey. Sundowns has the one. Hmm. So from that point of view, yes. Um, but a club like Mamelodi Sundowns with Patrice Motsepe involved is is paying his players or has the ability to pay his players just as much as Al Ahli is paying their players. Mm. So if it gets down to the nuts and bolts, this isn't like a Ned Bank Cup where you've got a first or a second division team when the players are earning peanuts up against sure. the PSL team. 
I'd say that um, that the, the, the Sundowns players, certainly the coaching staff, um, are up there uh, with the best paid teams on the continent. And I, st I think there should be an expectation from Patrice Matsepe and certainly from South Africa, um, and especially when we consider that the PSL is meant to be one of the top 10 leagues in the world in terms of money coming in, sponsorships. Mm. We should be able to compete with anyone on the African continent, including uh, teams like Al Ahli, even though they are the club of the century and uh, they've got a lot of good players. Um, I'd say from a style point of view, they're probably the closest to a European playing football team and possibly that's what we struggle with um, as opposed to uh, Sundowns playing against some of the other Southern, Southern African uh, sides. Uh, but certainly they're there for the taking. They've not beaten them yet in the history of the competition, I'm not mistaken. I think they've drawn a couple of times and they've yeah. been beaten a couple of times. So they haven't slayed the dragon, so to speak. Um, but I think they've got a team to do it and, and, and all South Africa should be behind them because we should be winning Champions League. Yeah, one of the positive things about this match, um, and this has been consistent from Mamelodi Sundown's side, uh, is that uh, fans will be able to uh, attend the game for free. Uh, and of course, they are encouraged to uh, wear their yellow shirts uh, in support of Mamelodi Sundowns. The match will be at uh, 3 p.m. on Saturday. Coach, you have anecdotes, uh, positive or negative. Uh, you, One of the teams that you won the league with is Mamelodi Sundowns, and you've experienced the same uh, athlete team. Talk to us about those experiences. Yeah, I think it was 2007 when um, when we played we played against Al Ahli. Our first game was exactly the same as it is uh, going to be on Saturday with Sundowns. We played them at home, and uh, we were two 0 down at half time, and we ended up drawing two two. Mm. But the biggest mistake we made, of course, was conceding two away goals. Yeah. It made it very very difficult for us, you know, to 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 go away to Cairo and try and beat uh, Al Ahli. It was very difficult there. The game was on, and uh, you know we got beaten. We lost by a penalty, but. Uh, as Rodney said early on, it's very, very difficult going to Cairo. I mean, the crowd, they're fanatical. They've got these little beams they shoot on the field and the, the atmosphere is unbelievable. And I think if Sundowns can overcome this kind of stuff, get a positive result here at home at Lucas Marepe and... I think probably one of the most important things is not to concede a goal. Yeah. You know, they're conceding away goal makes things really difficult. But if they if they can go out there, get a good victory, win one 0 win two 0 which would be fantastic to win two 0 but get a good result, they've got something to play for in Egypt. Yeah, I think the positive thing as well, um I'll give I'll hand over to you, Clint. I think you have an opinion about this. I think the positive thing about Sundowns uh, versus Al Athlete is that in the group stages, Al Athlete did not win away. Uh, they played against Simba, I think they played against Vita Club, uh, they lost and then they drew one of their away games. Do you have a point? Yes, I, I just wanted to raise the, the point about the, the fans coming in for free and, and uh, uh, Gordon alluded it to as well, is that when you go over there, mm. you feel the, the intimidation, yeah. you feel that you're in a game that not a single person in that stadium wants you to win. Um, there's an importance placed on the, on the Champions League for, for teams in, in North Africa that doesn't seem to exist in South Africa. So we bring, so sometimes bring a Barcelona down to play mm. and we fill the stand. When they're bringing our athlete down to play, are they going to fill the stand? Does it mean as much? Why doesn't it mean as, mean as much to a South African supporter um, as it does to a North African supporter? Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that, that maybe is an educational uh, that the clubs and South Africans and journalists and the media have to play because in South Africa, we're all in love with the European Champions League and uh, we all make sure that we watch those at nine and 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. But here come the greatest team, club team on the African continent to our shores to play our greatest club team in a, in a long, long time. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure we're going to fill that stadium. And, and I just hope that South Africans, well, doesn't matter what team you support, possibly come in and get behind because we don't have a lot of teams that are competing in these Champions Leagues and doing well. See it as a South African adventure uh, and, and come get behind it. Yeah, you know I, mean, I mean, one of the one of the one of the positive things um, about this whole um, continental experience is that Sundowns have acquired a lot of experience, and you see it uh, playing itself out even in the manner in which they approach Absa Premiership games. Uh, on Monday, Mamelodi Sundowns played against Orlando Pirates. Uh, it was for the second time that Sundowns approach a, a rather defensive. It's not necessarily all-out defensive. However, uh, in the last 15 minutes of the game on Monday against Orlando Pirates, uh, they. Played played uh, without a striker. Uh, it was the same or similar way uh, when they played against Bitvers Verts. They learned these uh, things of managing games. Uh, let's talk about that, Rodney, a bit uh, in terms of the experience that they've acquired on the continent and the ability to manage games. I'm sure that will come in handy in terms of not conceding a goal. Yeah, that was quite important. Ben. Took coming back to that Monday game, that was a smashing game between uh, Pirates and Sundowns. Um, but the, 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 the experience on the African continent is obviously um, provided them with that tactical discipline that you that you that you talked about yeah. in the way that they approach the game and manage the game and and and, and they can see off when teams are, are are attacking them and that 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 was exceptional 
The the other thing that we need to, to look at, especially when coming back to Al Akhli, sure. is um, as far as I'm concerned, is that they 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 they're very good with the dark arts of the game, and that's something Sundowns <laughs> will need to manage as well, because they can buy time. They've got the delaying tactics, they fake injuries, and all the we've we, we've seen that, yeah. and that's something that Sundowns needs to ma- needs to manage as well. And I'm sure Gordon has probably got a few stories of that as well from his experience with uh, Al Akhli. Yeah, I mean the dark arts coach. How important is that? The dark arts, of course, for our listeners, uh, is the ability to waste time is the ability to intimidate referees on and off the field as well there are other things that you can do to distract your opponents talk us talk to us about your experiences uh, in, in in the CAF Champions League and maybe some stories that you would have uh, in, 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 in when playing in these cup competitions no I think Rodney's quite right you know when a team like our athlete comes here they know that it's going to be very difficult for any team to actually beat them in Cairo they know that and they also know they need to come here so when you when you, when they're playing away from home and they're playing against a team like Sundowns who are very very capable of turning things on, keeping possession, getting balls into areas and putting the opposition on their back foot. They'll try and break your rhythm. They will go down. The keeper will go down. He'll have cramp. And it's a stop-start, stop-start situation. Mm. And it becomes frustrating. And I think, uh, you know, Pizza would have, uh, over the years, learned to be able to deal with this. He would have told his team that, you know, don't let these things frustrate you. You know, if the player wants to go down, let him go down. Keep focused. Keep your mind on what we have to do. We need to score a goal. We need to keep our shape. We need not to start panicking, start kicking, start getting frustrated, start arguing with the referee. They need to be very, very professional. And, you know, just to come to, to, come to Sundown's defence, they've had a tough season, you know. They, it's playing away, playing home. And mm. as, as, as Rodney said early on, the, the game against Rwanda Pirates, they, they manage the game well because they know against Rwanda Pirates that their closest rivals, they mustn't lose this game. Mm. So I think, you know, as you say, never play with a striker towards the end of the game. Pitzer knew exactly what he was doing. He was saying to himself, you know what, if I get a point out of this, I'm going to keep, yeah. I'm going to stay four points in front of them. Well, I'm going to stay three points in front of them. If the result went the other way, <clears> they would have been under huge pressure. Mm. Can we ask you a question, Gordon? When you are in these kind of games, a South African team playing against Al Akhli, do you find it hard to pick the players up for a game like this because it's not something that the continent or South Africa is in love with, as opposed to if Sundowns were playing against the Kaiser Chiefs or Orlando Pirates? Is there that same uh, tension, uh, excitement in the, the dressing room? Do you sense that or do you feel you've got to convince them that this is just as important. And um, what's the mindset of the players going into these these games? No, I think I think at this stage of the competition, you don't have to motivate your team. They know what's at stake. You know, they know that Sundowns is a, is a, is a big team. They know that expectations are very, very high. We know that that Sundowns should be able to be competing with the best teams in Africa. And are actually, without a doubt, are one of those teams. And I'm sure they're just looking forward to the opportunity of going out there and saying to themselves, you know what, we can do this. And they know. I think, I think Clinton, you know, in the earlier rounds and why we are not so... It's only in the last few years, I think, that we've taken Africa competitions very seriously. Absolutely. You know, beforehand, it used to be like, oh, you know, we're going to... I don't want to mention any, any, any country's names, but we're going to this particular country. The food is terrible. Correct. The conditions are bad. And then you'll get players saying, oh, you know, I can't go. I'm injured. Or, and they weren't really keen. I think over the last year, and, and I think Orlando Pirates and Sundowns have played a big role in this, where they've turned the mindset of players. You know that it's, we've got to go past these difficult circumstances, playing against these smaller teams on very, you know, the budget breaks down it takes you it takes you an hour and a half to get from the airport to the to the to the hotel you stay in it that's before the game off the game it takes you 10 minutes mm-hmm. so they've, they've taken you on a long ride around the whole country for two and a half hours and it's really only 10 minute ride away so they, these used to be the tactics that were used in Africa and I can remember even when I was at uh, at sundowns we had these kind of situations and I used to say to Patrice at that time you know what Patrice when these guys come here let's give them the best treatment because maybe they're going to learn something and Patrice would only do that he wouldn't mm-hmm. I didn't have to ask him to do do that so it wasn't like oh we'll get you back because you're coming to us next so we're sure. going to do the same thing we try to educate them and I think pirates and sundowns and uh, have done this kind of thing when no matter how you get treated away from home when the when the next when they come back to come play you at your ground give them the best give them the five star hotel give them the best treatment and maybe they'll change their mindset and I think this has happened okay so you would be asking questions um, on your experiences of well, athlete something that, that that I'm very interested in asking you is um if you if you if you consider that 2007 Al Ahly team that you played against, and the current Al Ahly side, I mean they had Abu, Muhammad Abu Tika at that time. If you compare those two sides, is this Al Ahly team on the same level as the one that you faced in 2007? 
You know, I'm not, I, I, I couldn't give that answer with certainty because I haven't seen a lot of Al Ahli lately. But as you said, Abbott Trukun, at that time, they were a really good team. But Al Ahli are a team that they will go out and they will get the players and they're going to be as strong as the last year, if not better. They want to keep improving. They've got the money. They are the, one of the biggest teams in Africa and especially in North Africa. You know, they're giants. Uh, I think I think Clint alluded to this. They are, they are uh, an absolute uh, uh, institute you know, in football in, in, in Africa. Yeah. So I think each year, the, the, whichever coach comes in, you must remember in, in Egypt, there was a lot of turmoil just uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. There, there was no football, there was no playing, and it was difficult. But for them to be back where they are now, and there was a period. And, and I think you said earlier on that they haven't won a game away from home, you know, which is obviously something concerning for them. But I wouldn't write too much into that, you know. Because sometimes. when they take you to Cairo, we know what's going to happen. <laughs> exactly, what they think that's going to happen. We need to make sure we don't let that happen. Yeah, exactly. Gordon, with them being one of the biggest teams on the continent, when a European team comes and plays us in a friendly uh, or preseason tournament, a lot of our players, I would imagine, at Sundowns or Chiefs or Pirates, when they play against these teams, see it as an opportunity to be seen and possibly the coach on the other side says, I like that player, let's take him back, uh, as maybe happened with old John Mabizela uh, in a preseason tournament with Spurs and, and a couple of others. Yeah. With Al Ahli and considering the amount of money that players at Sundowns are now earning and Kaiser Chiefs and Pirates, when Sundowns face Al Ahli on, on Saturday, are any of the players going out there with an intention to impress, to possibly get to Al Ahli, the biggest team in Africa, as a gateway then to, to the rest of the world? Or have we got comfortable enough now in, our, in, our, in what we earn and what we do in South Africa where it's more about beating the team and playing for the, for the badge as opposed to playing for a better, uh, a, a, a better opportunity in football? Mm. I think I think our players go out there. Obviously, when you play in a game, not only is there going to be African people watching the game, there's going to be a lot of scouts all over the place. Teams from England might come over and watch certain games or certain players. And I think I don't think our players are, are looking to get better salaries or going to. I think they're looking for maybe if they're looking to move to go to Europe, to go to a, a team like a, a Germany or in, in England or Spain or go play there. I'm not sure if they if if, if they they're looking to go to a team like in in in, uh, in Cairo or in Egypt. Although we have recently had a player playing there from Wits University and after a short while he came back again. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to quite suit us. You know, we've got, the player's got to be happy where he is. And, sure. it's, and, and Cairo's very difficult circumstances. You know, the, it's a different type, of, different type of football. It's a different country altogether. Um, I've been there on a few occasions and it's, I think it's a great country. I think it's, it's really good. But I don't think our players are looking in this game to be spotted by somebody from that club. If, if you were national team coach, would you rather have your national team players playing in the B League in Belgium? or for Al Ahli in, uh, in Egypt, which yeah, would, which would no, be benefiting your player yeah, more in your there, opinion? There's no doubt about that. I'll be, say, playing for Al Ahli, you know, because, uh, I mean, they, they are playing in the number one league. You don't want to really go and play. You see, people use those teams and second division teams in Belgium for a stepping stone, really. You know, sure. if you go there, you do well, you become the top goal scorer, and then all of a sudden, there's everybody looking at you because you're in Europe, you know? So, um, well, maybe, without a doubt, I would say probably in Egypt. But then again, the opportunity, you're going to be probably seen more playing for a team in Belgium in the second division then you will be seen playing in Egypt sure mm, alright and then the last one on the same topic of course um, we also have a discussion on Orlando Pirates and Bitvis Verts that is the top of the table encounter the last one I'll give the two of you gentlemen Clint and uh, Rodney uh, so Sundowns and, and uh, actually we know uh, the, uh, the other teams in the quarterfinals uh, we also have Horoya Vedad Casaplanca Simba Sports Club TP Mazembe Constantinos and, and Ten Satif now those are the teams that are left uh, the question from me then is if Sundowns hurdle over Al Ahli, do they genuinely have a chance of winning uh, this CAF Champions League edition of 2019? Without a doubt, without a doubt, get past Al Ahli, they can put themselves in 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 line as one of the favourites probably for the competition if they get past Al Ahli. Right, yeah, I've got to agree with Rodney. I think Sundowns um, have to put their hands up and say we we one of the best uh, teams on the continent. You you hurdle Al Ahli, and I think you can get through the rest. It's not a guarantee. Because as we've seen at this level of football, any team can beat any, any team on the day, but certainly the opportunity exists. All right, then. And before we move right along to the next topic of discussion, uh, every Wednesday you can get yourself a copy of the Sokola Duma newspaper for only 3 rand 90 cents. A quick look at what was covered in this week's edition of the Sokola Duma newspaper. There was a conversation between our journalist Biva Nazo and Gabardino Mango. Gabardino Mango is not playing at Bitvis Verts. Why is that the case? If you want to see that, check the latest edition of the Sokola Duma newspaper. There's also a feature on this game, Al Ahli versus uh, uh, Mamelodi Sundowns. And there's also a 
nice interview which I enjoy uh, enjoyed between Lunga Adam and uh, Tapelo Liao. If you can't remember him, he used to play for Real Stars and at some point he went to Orlando Pirates. What happened? Uh, what led to him not succeeding at Orlando Pirates? Well, you can check that out on the latest edition of the Sokola Duma newspaper for only 3 Rand 90 cents every Wednesday. Now, the next topic of discussion, Big Bitvis Verts and Orlando Pirates is a top of the table encounter. I'm, I'm certainly going to enjoy that. Uh, Guys, let's talk about that. The implications. Uh, Bitvis Verts are on 41 points. They are number three. Orlando Pirates on 41 points. They are number two. Mamelo de Sundowns are on 44 points. They are number one. They are all on the same amount of games. Coach Gordon, uh, a title deciding encounter. Should we term it as that? Or is it generally in the grand scheme of things an important encounter anyways? I think it's a it's a it's a huge match for both teams because both of them know a draw is not going to suit them. Sundowns will be sitting there hoping there's going to be a draw. Uh, obviously, that's what they, that would suit them greatly sure. because there's only there's only a, a few points separating, three points separating yes. at, at second and third, and one goal separating second and third. So mm. goals are also important. But I think Sundowns are going to sit back, watch this game, and say, you know what, a draw will suit me. Pirates know they just had a very tough game. They've thrown not one say they've thrown two game, good points away, but they lost two points I think in their last game where they needed them desperately. And I think Vitz as well know exactly they were in a very good position and then this draw put Vitz back into the race again mm. now they they know if they win this game they can go equal on points with uh, with Sundowns so I think it's a huge game for both teams both teams want to win the game I don't think a draw will suit either of them mm. so obviously we'll be looking for a match here uh, a very attacking match on both sides yeah gents any any more for no, any more I agree, I agree. it's going to be a, it's going to be quite an attacking game um, these they've, they've got apps they've just got to go for it um Pirates never scored um, against Sundowns in the week. Uh, Gavin Hunt's uh, Vitz hasn't done too well in, in yeah, recent weeks. they've conceded a lot of goals in the exactly, past four or five games. But they've scored quite a bit. Um, yeah. uh, if you go and look at the goals for Tally, uh, Vitz have scored 36 goals. Pirates have scored 33 goals. So I'm expecting goals in this and encounter. And even in the previous game, I mean, the net bank cup, it was a 4-4 four, 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 and four, ended on penalties. Yeah. So uh, I'm expecting quite a bit of goals because like Gordon says, they can't afford to draw. So they're going to have to go for it, both of them. All right, and make for quite I'll, an interesting game there. I'll pose a question for you, Clint. Uh, uh, and Gavin Hunt as well, Coach Gavin, has admitted to this. Um, he didn't want to admit, but eventually in the past few weeks, he admitted to this. There was a point where Bitvis Verse could have had at least a 12-point gap when Orlando Pirates and uh, Mamadou Sundowns were engaged in CAF competitions. Uh, would you say that they've thrown the title away? Of course, the points suggest that they are still in it. Uh, what do you make of them being number one, 12 points away, coached by a Gavin Hunt that has won four titles, and then now they're finding themselves in this position? Yeah, look, I think um, Sundowns and Orlando Pirates, they, they, their schedules are heavy, but they've also got big squads. So they're doing, uh, they're doing battle on multiple fronts, as a big team uh, should. And certainly, consider a smaller team, Vitz, although uh, from a payroll point of view, from a name point of view, sure. certainly they're able to punch with the, with the big boys. I think Gordon should always be expected to be up there uh, with Vitz. In terms of throwing away points, it's the it's age-old uh, expression, and, and most of your coaches and managers will say, um, until the game has been played, points, points in the bag mean nothing for for other teams so mm. so don't do the don't do the math especially not early in the season because the, the the permutations are, are huge i think um, this is a classic six pointers what they call it sure. we take three points away from you and and we and we've got three points that move us up the log um, and then keep in mind that um, sundowns have just been called in uh, for this ineligible player absolutely uh, that could be uh, three points uh, uh, docked uh, we don't know what's going to happen there but that's going to play a, a huge factor so this ga this game even more uh, important uh, when you consider that that Sundowns may maybe dock a couple of points in the next couple of days, and we, and we should hear about that. Yeah, and I just want to come back to 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 the to the whole Gavin Gavin issue. And maybe Gordon can 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 elaborate a bit on that. Yeah. Because they've conceded such a lot of goals, and that's very un Gavin Hunt like. Because yeah, his teams yeah, are normally yeah. extremely disciplined defensively, and three of three four of the of that back five are Bafana players. Bafana Bafana. <laughs> And yet they're conceding so many goals. So, Gordon, if you if you have a look at that from a coaching point of view, what is the problem there? Is it is it a Gavin says it's 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 bad luck. Is it bad luck? Yeah, you know sometimes the ball doesn't bounce for you, you know, and and, and you know you can call it bad luck. 
because sometimes you do have a lot of bad luck and sometimes you can say we, we haven't been defended well from the front, you know, because whenever you concede goals, you always turn around and say, well, you know, our defenders, our defenders, like you just said, our three of the defenders are Bafana Bafana players. But we, who lost the ball? Who gave the ball away in such a silly right. position? Mm. You know, the left back's going on an overlap you and you've got a simple pass to make in the middle of the park and you give the ball straight to the striker, boom, he goes and scores. I mean, that's one of those things. Now, you either can call that bad luck or very uh, ill-disciplined in respect of giving the ball away in areas where you shouldn't be giving it away. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of a lot of little things that you can point out to. But, you know, having said all that, I think there was a stage where they could have been 12 points in front. They, sure. had a, they were really in a very good position to go on and, and, and get a gap between themselves and the rest of the teams. Mm -hmm. And that never happened. But you still got to say to yourself, they're still right up there. They're only three points away. But if I can just change this a little bit, you know, Pirates in which we're talking about this game, you know, they're going to have to play. But if you look, if they draw this game and Cape Town City win their next game, Cape Town City are going to go above them. And Super Sport win the next game. Super Sport are probably going to go above them, well, not on goal difference, because the goal difference is four and eleven for those mm -hmm. two teams. Mm -hmm. So there's just so much at stake because you know we're all thinking to ourselves, "Ah, oh, it's a Sundowns Pirates and Vitz, who's going to do it?" Don't discount, don't discount Cape Town City. There's no attention on them at the moment, and that's where I like to be. I like to always, you know, when I won the league with Santos, everybody thought oh, the bubble's going to burst just now, <laughs> and, it, and everybody didn't care about us. They were worried about Chiefs, they were worried about Pirates, and we sneaked in there, and we won it convincingly. And I think the same thing yeah you know I think uh, I think uh, Ben uh, um, McCarthy is doing a good job in taking the pressure off his team by oh, you know we're there and you know it's okay we're still a young team and whatever the case mm -hmm. may be is. but I can tell you right now they're dreaming about winning the championship because they put themselves in a real position the same as Super Sport to win the championship so any one of those five teams can win it Gordy makes a good point with that Cape Town City analogy because I remember when Santos won the league back in what's that 2001 yeah. and I followed it quite closely Gordon knows I, I used to travel with him sometimes yeah. when I was covering it. And they sneaked up on, on, on the opposition brilliantly that season to go, to go on and win the league. It so at that point, there were impressive. other teams that were number one and number two and number yeah, three. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. All right. And another element to this, of course, is Coach Militon Sredojevic. Uh, they've sort of put all their eggs in one basket, similar to how Sundowns have been, in that they are, not, they are not in contention in any of the competitions. They haven't won anything for the past two seasons. Um or under, under coach Militon Sredojevic this match uh, and this league if he doesn't win it they play really good football I enjoy them uh, however he would be under pressure uh, of course if he doesn't go on to win it now, he's now been knocked out of the CAF Champions League let's talk Militon Sredojevic a little bit and the implications of him not winning the league now that he's out of the CAF Champions League you know, I'm going to protect the coaches here because I've been in that situation. You know, you you it's so difficult to win a championship. And you must remember, every team you play against wants to beat you. Mm. You must also remember that over the last few years, Pirates have had quite a few changes in coaching departments. And yeah. the players, unfortunately, would have, for example, uh, Eric Tinkler. Then they would have Roger Desar, and he's got a different philosophy. And he'll teach a team to play a certain way, want them to play a certain way. A new coach comes in. I think the coaches need to be given a good, good opportunity, three years, four years. And, you know, I think... I think he's put himself in a good position to win this championship. As mm. I said, there's five teams that can win it. But the bottom line is there's six games to go and he's still there. So I think, you know, and it's, these kind of things that can put a coach under pressure if he's not experienced enough. And I think he is experienced enough to, you know, sometimes I never even read a newspaper. I didn't want to hear about uh, what's going to happen if I don't win this game yeah. or am I going to be fired or am I going to keep my job? Because that's, that's just normal football talk. But at the end of the day, I think... Yes, he wants to win something. He has to win something soon because Pirates have, have made a lot of changes. I think he's uh, I think he's got another year left of his contract. Yeah. And I don't think it should be a situation where if you don't win the league this year, you're gone. Mm. Uh, let's, let's, if you don't win the league this year, you've had a good season to build on and let's win it next season. Rodney, Clint, if he comes number two, if he, if he becomes a runner-up this season, he would have been a runner-up last season and runner-up this season. Do you think that you, the Orlando Pirates fans would tolerate that? Uh, what are your experiences? Because, of course, you've covered football over the years and you know what happened to Coach Roger Desar, what happened to Coach Eric Tinker. Those guys went to like four finals. Uh, however, they didn't win all of those finals and fans were fed up and they said, these guys must go. Yeah, I, th I think Mitch is under massive pressure. Um, as nice a, a guy as you are, a nicer person as you are, best intentions to win for the fans. I think if you had Pirates or you had Chiefs or you had Sundowns and you don't deliver something within two, in two seasons, something significant, I think you're going. Um, what makes it even more difficult for Mitch is he's got two very powerful assistant coaches at that club, yeah. Fadlu Davids and Rilani. Yeah. Um, and in my opinion, I think um, they are being groomed to take over that job, especially I think Rolani's got the, uh, is ahead in that, uh, in that race. Mm. And possibly some are saying too many cooks uh, spoil the, 
spoil the the spoil the pot, yeah. spoil the pot, and 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 maybe that's what's happening. And and contesting with two very powerful uh, lieutenants, if you if you will, must be difficult for for Michu as well. Um, in terms of the fans turning on you, and in terms of of powers behind the scenes possibly working against the coach, Gordon more than anyone knows that Orlando Pirates a, a call can be made, um, and and suddenly a, a taxi full of fans are turning up at a at a training session. Yeah. Um. So it's it's an incredible tough. Or there's a call from the chairman saying we can't guarantee your safety. Um, and that's enough sometimes for a foreign coach to say, okay, thank you, but no, thank you. So it'll be interesting times. Um, is the standard of football good enough for the fans? Are they being entertained to the point where where uh, a, a title isn't necessary because they're happy with what they're seeing? I'm not sure that's the case at, at Orlando Pirates either. So um, I would say that uh, that Pirates need a, a title or, or Michu might be uh, on his way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he yeah. probably is is under pressure. Um, uh, personally, in and I'm on, I'm in I'm in Gordon's I'm in Gordon's court. For I, sure, I, for I sure. think I think coaches need a bit of time, and that even if he came second this season, he could probably go on and win it next season. But that's not the nature if you're coaching Chiefs uh, or, or Pirates, as 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 Clint alluded to. So, uh, as much I wouldn't want to say that as I would want wouldn't want to say that he's under pressure. He's under pressure. Yeah, I mean, we've spoken to Farouk Khan. I want to divert a little bit, but still on this Orlando Paris issue, we've spoken to Farouk Khan, um, and he made an example of European clubs uh, and them having a technical team of around 15 uh, people, competent people, uh, all of them, most of them having a UEFA A or UEFA Pro. Um, we are now seeing a team, Orlando Paris, having serious coaches. Mamelo de Sundowns had serious coaches in Coach Rulani, Coach Wendell, Coach Mangoba, assisting coach. Uh, coach, talk about that. Are there any power uh, dynamics, any grapplings with, within uh, a clash of ideas within the coaches who are in their own right coaches? Anyways. Yeah, I think I think what's important here is that the coach is able to select his own uh, his own uh, technical team. I think it's important to trust the people that are around you. You know, because sometimes, and I've had this experience myself, that you know, you, the guy below you just wants your job. You know, behind the scenes, you put his arm around the player and tell the player, you know, if I was the coach, yeah, you'd be playing in the mm. team. You know, and start stirring and, and, and making things happen. And, you know, he's working really not with the coach, but rather than against the coach. And I don't think this is the situation now. I think, I think uh, Misha is, is, is clearly is happy with his, with his technical team, I think. I think there's, there's no problem there. I think we said that he's two years finished second. I think the first year, uh, the year previous to this year, he only joined halfway through, I think, if I'm not correct. Mm. I think I'm correct in saying he only joined halfway through. At that time when he did join, they weren't really in a great position and he finished second on the log. Mm. So one, the excitement was there and the expectation were okay we can win the league next year because he's done so well in the six months he was with us but must remember as I said earlier on I mean Sundowns are now sl are no slouches they're a good team Gavin Hunt has got uh, Vitz University to a, to a certain level that they're always going to be competitive they might not have the best squad or they might not play the way that you want to but they're very solid and they they, 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 they grind out results and, and that's what they've been doing Cape Town City are the new kids on the block they just flare this they go play you know and then they're super sport they've also got a, a pedigree so I think I think at the moment to say well you know it's not like he's coaching a, a, a Barcelona he's coaching Pirates and he's, and, and he's teams equally as strong as Pirates. Mm. There's, there's five, five teams, as I said, can win the championships and there's not much separating these teams. You know, a little bit of luck here. Uh, uh, the, the, the margin of success is so thin. It's just uh, one inch over here is success, one inch over here is failure. You know, so uh, I think it's very, very tough. And again, the expectations are becoming so high on coaches. You know, people, oh, he's got to win it. Now he's, you know, he's got to win it. He's got to win it. There's no such thing as you've got to. No one is entitled to win it. You've got to go out there. You've got to work very, very hard. You've got to be, that's why I always say winning a league championship is so difficult because you've got to be consistent over a whole 30 games or, mm. or whatever the case may be. You've got to be, you've got to be so, so lucky. You've got to have not have too many injuries. You've got to, things have got to roll your way. And it's a tough, tough, tough to win a championship. And, 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 and yeah, in the case of Sunday, Pirates, Vitz, Cape Town City and Supersport are all within four points of each other. So why is one team entitled to win it? At the end of the day, you know, people are talking about when Sundowns are playing Vitz or when Pirates played against Sundowns, but it's the games when they play against Morocco. Mm -hmm. It's the games when they play against these teams that are fighting a relegation or just in ninth position trying to get in the top eight become more difficult than a Pirates versus Chiefs game or a Sundowns versus Vitz game. They're playing Morocco, I'd rather play Vitz every day or Pirates every day than play against Morocco away from home when they're sitting on the bottom of the 
log fighting to to get a point to win the champion or to to avoid relegation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah you're still listening to Sokola Duma Radio. We are live. Um, my name is Ngulule Konkeu. I'm your host usually, and we have four-time winning Absa Premiership coach uh, Gordon Egerson and uh, Rodney Rhinus uh, is part of the family uh, at Sokola Duma, and we also have Clint Roper. Before we move on to the next one, uh, I want to hear your opinions, guys, about uh, a bloated technical team. Uh, what kind of challenges do you think that that would pose to the South African public even? Because somehow South Af- the South African public is conditioned to channeling their frustration on one man. When you look at Orlando Paris, throughout a 90-minute period, you see different people standing up, uh, shouting instructions, uh, you know. So to the two of you gentlemen, what do you think is, is happening to the public now? Uh, at the end of it, when Orlando Pirates are number 16, uh, Orlando Pirates are number 8, uh, where would the fans channel their, their, their energies on, and their anger? There's, there's only one person who, who gets the, the anger, and that's the man at the, at, who, who's steering the ship. Mm. And um, I think that's why many coaches will, as, as Gordon rightly says, and not just in South Africa, but all over the world, when a new head coach comes in, he'll bring, uh, he'll, he'll bring his trusted, uh, the, 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 the people who've worked with him um, throughout his career, um, who've obviously been part of a, of a magic formula to make that particular coach uh, successful. I see certain traits or characteristics in, 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 in lieutenants uh, that help the cause. So unless there's a clear indication that there's been uh, um, th- that a lieutenant has undercut the head coach, and, mm. and uh, in the past we've had uh, we've had players like uh, Bongani Zungu claim that Rulani is the real boss at uh, Orlando is Pirates. It sundowns, yeah. um, so uh, so I mean that's uh, at Sundown. So the, unless there's clear interference, and the fans will pick up on that, then you'll have a, a sub uh, an assistant coach maybe feeling feeling the heat. Um, but other than that, the media, the TV, radio, the fans will, will look at numero uno and you'll be the first to go. It's easier to fire one head coach than it is to fire a complete uh, uh, technical. assistant yeah. technical team. Sure. Yeah, it's going to go that way. I mean, there was the, the, the old famous saying that uh, the buck stops here. And that's how it is with coaches as well. You could have 50 people in your technical staff or you could have three. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the buck stops with the coach and he's got, he's got to carry the can. All right. And then um, player welfare. Uh, it's been a topic uh, of discussion. We had a podcast about it on Wednesday. It was a big issue. Player welfare is a topic that was brought about because we've once again on the roads lost another South African football player. Osna um, Janti passed on on Monday um, in a car accident. We've lost uh, Cecil L- Lolo over the years. We've uh, lost uh, Leslie Manyatela, Gift Leremi and, and so many players. Uh, and the question that we posed on that podcast, we spoke to guys like Chabam Gomeni, Coach Owen Dagama, and the South African Football Players Union. Uh, we spoke to a lot of people about this. Uh, I need to pose this to you guys as well. Coach, how do... Football has a un, is a unique career in that you work for a few hours as a player, for three hours per day, perhaps, in training, and for the hours that you spend in during match day. Uh, there's a lot of time in your hands and that was confirmed by Jabo Malulega who's currently one of the best players in the absolute premiership for Polukwana City uh, that there's a lot of time in the players' hands. So how do clubs uh, ensure that they occupy the players' times? Uh, how do they go about educating players? You know, I think the most important thing you have to understand is that football is a professional sport, okay? And um, if you work in a bank, I don't think they after hours tell you how to operate and how to do things, mm. but it's it's just during the period of the time before they come professionals that is important. You know, when you've got an academy and you're teaching kids and the, and the agents of today, I think they're doing a good job. They, they, they're trying to educate the players in the sense of how to spend their money. Don't go buy a car, buy a beautiful home rather, you know, and how to how to look after yourselves, how important, learn, teach them to respect the game because it's a, it's a short career football, you know. And I think there was a time when, you know, players were all of a sudden, they're coming from an area where all of a sudden they're getting uh, 200,000 rand a month mm. and it, you know, they've never known how to deal with this. And I think it starts from the bottom. You know, you, you can, a club, I don't think it's, a club can, can, can help a player and, and, and put him through certain situations when he's having a bad time and, and try and help him and guide him. But he should know before that, that, that how important uh, certain things are and how, you know, to educate him in certain aspects of the game and how to spend his money correctly, how to behave yourself, how to not go out and drink. And, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about this because I think I've lost five players that club, clubs have played for me. Mm. And I can tell you, I'll, I'll give you an example, when, when Giftley Remy turned his life around and he was, um, he was playing for me at Sundowns. And, um, you know, I got a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning 
from a, a captain of the police force saying to me, one of your, one of your players have been involved in a car accident. Oh. And, uh, you know, you, you sit and ask yourself the question, you know, who is it? And you don't know, no one will tell you. And then and by, the, by the time you get to training, the whole squad is there. And I can remember at sundowns, the whole squad was standing at the front of the parking gate. And we were watching players come in and there came surprise. Here came Godfrey Sapula, here mm. came Tori Alba, here sure. came so-and-so, here came so-and-so, here came so-and-so. And all of a sudden, one player didn't come. And everybody used to be on time. And we should start training up past nine, by quarter past nine or nine o'clock. Everybody had to be at the stadium and change and be on the field by quarter past nine. And straight away we knew that uh, this particular player didn't turn up. And uh, we heard. And it's so sad. It's such a horrible thing. And it's just, a, you know, it's just, it's just something that we should, I mean, it's mostly car accidents, driving fast and, you know, uh, your players want to go away for the weekend if they play in, if you look, for example, in Maritzburg, we used to, we used to do this, uh, Clint, uh, I know it sounds a bit crazy, but uh, on a Sunday morning, I'll tell my players we train Sunday morning and they didn't need to train, mm -hmm. but I didn't want them driving sure. from, from, you know, in a quick, from Maritzburg to Johannesburg. You know, they drive in 150 miles an hour to get there quickly to spend some time with their families and then they train on Monday morning, they leave in Sunday at three o'clock in the morning, they're getting tired and they're driving back again. So, you know, Farouk Kadodi and ourselves, we, we discussed these things and we used to say to the guys, okay guys, I want you to come in on Sunday morning. So they couldn't go Saturday night or after the match on a, mm. on a Friday because they knew they had training on Sunday. And who knows, maybe we saved a couple of lives. But it's, 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 a, it's a very difficult situation because I think we, we just got to do more for our players in the sense of, of helping them in the beginning. So what Gordon's talking about there is a very unsophisticated way of putting, uh, putting measures in place to look after players, understanding what happens with players. I believe in, in the PSL, we are far, far behind. We've caught up in terms of sports science and physiotherapy and mm. methods of training and uh, sleep patterns and diets, et cetera, to bring, to bring our athletes up to par with, with what's happening in the rest of the world. I, I question whether um, from a, a psychological uh, point of view, clubs are on par with other clubs in terms of managing uh, youngsters. Um, my personal opinion is, uh, as a soccer player, especially if you're a young player, you've just signed for Chiefs of Pirates of Sundowns, and you, and you look, let's take it way back and look at Jabu uh, Pule Mahlangu, who's now turned his life around. Yeah. All of a sudden, you go from nobody to a superstar. If, I've, if, if I'm a coach of a, of a team, who, and there's a young kid who's just scored a hat-trick in a derby or a big game, I'm informing somebody to make sure that this guy has an elevated sense of self, a, a god complex, if you like. Yeah. Possibly he's going to go drink because he thinks he's untouchable. He's gonna go drive. He's, there, a million people are gonna be wanting to drinking and buying him drinks and driving with him. This guy is a, th is a threat for the next 24, 48 hours to himself. How are we gonna police him? How are we gonna help him? And police is maybe a strong word, but certainly um, the, the minds of these players and, and the way that they handle their fame needs to be managed um, by trained people, psychologists. Mm. Bring them back and un make them understand that they live by the same rules as everyone else, even though we've got bus drivers and, and uh, who, uh, normal people in the street, the same rules. If you crash your car, you're going to get hurt. Mm. Um, and it applies to you. And, and I think that's maybe where we're letting ourselves down. I think where the clubs are falling down, agents who make a lot of money off these players' wages and bonuses and, 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 should also be putting things in place besides the pensions and the what are you doing after football from a financial point of view. At the time, is, is it providing them with the services of sports psychologists to manage their mental health and their state of being um, to, so that they become uh, better professionals. Mm. Yeah, Clint's, got the, Clint's got the right point there, but the, 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 the discussion is, 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 is twofold as well, I think. I think clubs need to do a little bit more, in, as, as he was saying, in terms of sports psychology, getting them to do a bit more um, after, after, our, after training, um, making the club environment conducive to where they stay longer, they want to mm. go to gym, bring in the sports scientists, bring in the psychologist and let them, let them spend more time at the club so, they, they, so that they don't have all these distractions. But the, 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 the counter to that is that I think players also need to be more responsible for themselves as well in terms of what they want to do. Because uh, I think South Africa's got a problem where we always want somebody else to do something for us. We also need to do some things for ourselves, which means uh, players have to be more professional, as Gordon said. They need to be more professional in their outlook. And obviously, if you're going to be driving drunk at three o'clock in the morning, you're going to have problems. Um, you know, so the, the the point is twofold. There's there's the responsibilities that the club has. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the responsibility that the player has to himself for his future and his ambition. You can go ahead. I just want to jump in here. I'm not sure. I, I, I agree with Rodney. Uh, but where I feel that South African soccer has a unique problem with 
uh, being accountable or, or being professional enough to manage yourself is in sports like rugby and cricket where a lot of your players have come through top government schools, then gone through tertiary universities which mm. support your sport to allow you to then become a springbok or, or a pro tier. Um, and so build yourself as a person to then manage fame, money, alcohol, and maybe make better informed decisions as to how to, to achieve that longevity. I feel that soccer has got a different route. And a lot of the kids that, that make it in South African soccer have not come through a top government school. And so the, the education, the, the building of the person per se, is not the same. And I think that gap needs to be understood by South African football and filled in by South African football who clearly have the money and the resources to bring in that, that, that gap of person building, I agree with you there. There needs to be, you, you need to take, uh, to, to build a person to take care of himself so that you're not just policed or looked after the whole time. And possibly we're South Africans who maybe are tuned into this right now, listening in. I know uh, in the UK, um, I, was a, I was a youngster there on Trialwood City. There would be kids who scored hat-tricks on, on, on a weekend, but we'd get to training on a Monday and the, and the kid would be gone. Because at 16, they'd go to a bar and have a couple of pints and think they'd get away with it. But the Manchester community, who were supporters and, and were Diggs' uh, parents and that, would call the club and say, you know that, that kid, uh, he was here at 3 o'clock in the morning vomiting all over the floor. Mm. And, he, um, and so the community, and in South Africa, I think we've got an opportunity to do that, where the community help uh, look after our footballers, help educate our footballers, help grow our footballers, help take care of them. Um, and, and clubs maybe tap into the community to... to uh, we've got fans, let the fans be part of the game. That's why they're, that's why they're there. Because your take before we move on? Yeah, I was going to say exactly what Clint said, you know, but what's important here, and I find this as well, that, you know, we've got legends in our game. Like, I'll give you a good example. It's not very, it's not, I said Bongo yeah. I mean, he retired at 40. He was quick. He was scoring goals. And he was, he's an absolute legend. And he's, he played for nearly 20 years. Other players, like Shoes, played for 20 years. There's players like uh, Macbeth Sabaya. And it's the, it's the Pee Wee Shabalala still playing. These are the players. Now you get a youngster coming through. And sometimes we had fault. You know, we had fault because a youngster got, scores a hat-trick, like you say, and we put him on a pedestal right next to Nombete. He's nowhere near Nombete. He's, <laughs> exactly. played, he's been playing for five minutes. Now he's a superstar. Yeah. You're a superstar when you've done that for 10 years, continuously scoring goals and playing, playing for your national team. And they, they, you're a legend. Yeah, yeah, we put the player who scores a hat-trick, oh, he's, and we put him in a, on the pedestal and he thinks he's Jack the Lad. Mm. He starts, he's arrogant because he thinks he's as good as. We need to keep him when he's keeping his feet on the ground. We need to call him and say, listen, you scored actually today, you know, but don't think you're all that. You know, when you get to Nombete's, uh, when you've done what Nombete has done, or you've done what Surprise Miruri has done, or you've done what Godfrey Sapul has done, then you can start messing around. Start start saying, you know, because, and these players, I used to, Bernard Parker, for example, great, uh, great with the youngsters. I used to, as a coach, I used to use these top players to go talk to him. So, you know, when you when the coach is coming, I think it's normal, ah, coach is on my back, he's telling me what to do. But when Bernard Parker goes over and say, listen, behave yourself, eh? Your career's only starting now. I want mm. you to really do well. We're watching you. Don't All right. naughty things. Yeah, a lot of what has been spoken about here, uh, we touched on on the previous podcast on the big issue. Are clubs responsible for players' uh, welfare, right? And, and 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 one of the things that I remember that was mentioned by Tabo Mgomeni was the fact that these players don't exist uh, in a vacuum. They come from communities. And if the community's conventional way uh, of enjoying a weekend is uh, binge drinking, then the players would uh, behave in that way. Uh, that's when the education that you guys mentioned uh, should come in there, that you are now a, a player whose body, you are should be responsible for your own body because that's how you make your money. All right, we move on then. Uh, it's quarter to seven, it's, it's quarter to three now. Uh, we only have a few minutes left in the podcast and thank you very much for being with us. Uh, if you're just joining us, we are discussing a lot of things. We discussed Mamelo de Sundowns against Al Akhli in the CAF Champions League first leg quarterfinal. We also moved Moved on uh, to Bitvers Verds and Orlando Pirates, the implications of the title in the absolute premiership the current season. Uh, we talked about that. We've now just spoken about player welfare. Are South African football players are looked after properly by clubs? We'll now move on to Bafana Bafana. Uh, Bafana Bafana qualified for the African Cup of Nations uh, 2019 in Egypt. The tournament will be in June. In the next few weeks, we'll know which group uh, Bafana, Bafana Bafana will be in. And uh, la yesterday, uh, the the... Uh, the, 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 the FIFA rankings uh, were released and Bafana Bafana are number 14 in Africa. Gents, let's talk about Bafana Bafana. The expectation is slightly high after the win against Libya. Coach, I'll start with you. Uh, and what do you make of their chances? Your impression on their qualification? Uh, there was a point where we were worried about not winning, not going through. Your, your impression of the qualification and what they will achieve in Egypt? 
Yeah, I think, first of all, I think it's appropriate that I congratulate Bafana Bafana on, mm. on a fantastic performance uh, away from home against Libya. That was a, a must-win situation and they did really, really well. And congratulations to uh, Stuart and his team. Now we, we, we've we qualified. It wasn't, uh, it was, a, it was. I think we were expected to qualify, but we made it quite difficult for ourselves. Mm. And I think, I think what Bafana Bafana have learned is to get points away from home. And they won two of their games away from home. And I think the most crucial one was beating Nigeria. The first game. Uh, in the, the first game. That, that set the... Set set us up nicely and then we went a little bit off again and then we came into our last game having to win but at the end of the day you know what we've qualified now and I think we can we can mix it with the best now mm, and uh, how far do you think they will go in the AFCON 2019 quarterfinals maybe bomb out in the group stages maybe or should we wait for the group first before we can be able to determine that you know I think I think we can we can Besides what group we're going to be in, we can we should be able to match ourselves with the best teams, whether it's Cameroon, whether it's Nigeria, whether whoever it is. Mm. We've got to not be in this competition to try and get into the semi final or try and get into the quarter final. You know, you've got to take each game as it comes. You've got to first of all manage your group, get into the knockout stages, and take each game as it comes. But I think if I sat here to say to you, oh, it would be nice if we get to the quarter final. I mean, you know, finishing second is like finishing last. So let's try, let's try and win it because we are capable of it. And I think Stuart's doing a great job with the team, and uh, we've got a bit of time now. And let's hope, but I think we can mix it with the best in Africa. Okay, so the message from you, coach, is that we should go all out and try to win it. Well, I think if you're going to compete in that kind of competition, you want to try and win it. I'm not saying we will win it; it'll be tough, but I think we're capable. I mean, if we can, if we can go out there and, and, and play the way we're capable of, because we beat, for example, Nigeria, one of the strongest teams in Africa as mm. well. You know, we've competed against uh, everybody. We can, we can compete. All right, Everybody's Jens. Good. Yeah, at least we've, we've, the performance got the monkey at the back now. Because, uh, you know, it, there's always the talk that they can't qualify for major competitions. Well, they've shown now that they can. And I thought their match against um, Libya, they showed fantastic control and tactical discipline in, in, in how they approached that game. The uh, unity and the spirit of the squad looked extremely good. And what that's going to do is going to have a nice spin-off into the PSL now, I think, in the, in the last two months. Because while the core of that Bafana squad is, is, is nice and settled, there might be a couple of places still open for, for selection. So you're going to get the players going out and saying, listen, uh, I can still do this, so I'm available for selection. So you're going to find a lot of the players playing hard because there's something to play for. Mm. Clint? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I think you've got to look at SAF and say we must be starting to move in the right direction when you consider that our ladies are playing in a World Cup this year. For sure. The under-20s have qualified for a tournament and, and now our, our men's senior team have qualified for a major tournament without having to actually host it, um, which is something new for us. Um, looking at that Libya game, I, th I think, and I, and I say this with trepidation because there may, may be a backlash, but I think for the first time uh, in a long, long time, we looked at the goalkeeper position and we went, well, maybe there's life without Kuna after all. I thought Keat was magnificent and behind him, you've still, still got Williams who can come in there. Mm. So as much as, uh, as Kuna is a, a, a national asset and still probably one of the best distributors of a, of a football from, from a goal mouth in the world, I'd say, in, in the top five even, um, I was very impressed with what Keat did um, and uh, it was a man of the match performance for me. It looks like we've got, um, what hasn't been great with Buffon in, 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 in the past years is every time a new coach comes in, a new style comes in. Um, and uh, and that style is the coach's style as opposed to a South African style. And you don't see that happen with England or Brazil or Spain or Holland. There seems to be a way of playing mm. that a coach who comes in fits, fits the way of playing. I'm not sure we've identified exactly what the South African blueprint for football is, but I would say it is a mix of, of short, quick passing, quick movement, confidence on the ball, um, but certainly the, the discipline that Baxter's instilled uh, from from that European background, which is what they what they learn and, and what they preach, there seems to be a, 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 a rigidity that we are are mixing our um, unbelievable and undeniable uh, technical ability with that's starting to, to to stand us in good stead. And if we can do that, we can beat teams like the Nigerias and the big boys on the continent. And so, we go there with time, as uh, as, as uh, Gordon has pointed out, to um, to make that squad. Uh, tight to bring in some big name players who actually weren't even on the field against Libya who sat on the bench um, and to get the, the the mix right so I might say there's a lot to look forward to for Bafana. Yeah and just to just to link on to, on to what Clint said there in terms of the key performance but let's not forget uh, Percy Tau and Lebo Motiba I mean there's always the, the the talk that South Africa doesn't have the strikers well I tell you these two names we got to remember I thought they were they're both sensational they've got big futures mm -hmm. and um I was extremely impressed with the two. Yeah, and Lebo Motiba as well is nominated for the Marc Vivian Faux Award, uh, wow. Best African Player Award in France. Uh, Persita scored 
two, three of the four goals that we scored in both away games. Uh, and the two against major, Libya were brilliant. He's a major, major player. All right, uh, before we move on then, I suppose we have uh, three minutes to talk uh, Cape Town City. Uh, and of course, it's no small topic. Uh, I mean, a coach mentioned it at some point in our conversation here that Cape Town City should be looked at. They won the MTN 8, they won the Telcom Knockout, uh, and they are now in the upper end of uh, the APSA Premiership. Are Cape Town City a big team? Uh, they, should they be considered amongst the big teams in South Africa, coach? You know, Cape Town City are, are as you say, they've, they've won a couple of trophies now and they've, they, they're doing well in the league. I think Benny's got a, a young team there and, they, and they're playing exciting football and attacking football. But how do you how, how do you say, oh, they're a big team? I mean, Kaiser Chiefs is a big team. Mm -hmm. they, they institute of South African football. Orlando Pirates institute of South African football. And there's, there's, there's a team like Cape Town City who in the 70s was a very, very big team. But we're not talking about the 70s, we're talking about right now. Yeah. I think Cape Town City are a very, very good side. You, they, they, you know, teams are going to have histories to be to become, and I think Cape Town City will become a very big team. But right now, you know, you've got to differentiate what, what you actually mean by saying, oh, for they're sure, a big team. Sure. You know, are they an are they, uh, institute? Not yet. I say they, they've got they got they got a lot of a lot of uh, catching up to do, but uh, they are a team that has done really really well, and um, I think they are a, a fantastic footballing team at the moment. Mm. They, they're doing Cape Town proud, and I think they can become a great team. But you know, you judge by your results. I mean, if you think of how many leagues Pirates have won, how many leagues uh, Kaiser Chiefs have won, they've been there, they've done that. You know, and yeah, you you know you can talk about Cape Town City, you can talk about uh, you can talk about Marisburg last season. You know, would you say Marisburg are a big team? They're mm. a team that I think last season finished second or third in the league. Fadu Davis did a fantastic job. But at right now to put them on the on the same in the same uh, uh, pedestal as as uh, Sundowns or, 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 or Pirates or Chiefs, I don't think they that's they're there yet. Mm. Yeah, it's way too, way, way too early. Um, I think if we, if, we, if we should find a way to describe City, we'll probably say that they're punching above their weight at the moment. Uh, yeah. Because uh, if, if, like, like Gordon was mentioning, um, you've you got to talk history when you talk big club. Um, Chiefs established 1970, Pirates 1937, Sundowns 1970, Vits 1921. Mm. Those are clubs with histories. Uh, City will probably get there. Um, I remember I had a, a, a conversation with uh, John Committers about a year after they established the club in 2016. Yeah. And he was surprised in how his club had taken off. He, he'd had the vision, but they'd even surprised him himself as the owner in terms of how they'd grown and, and how they'd taken the, the, the city by storm. Look, they've been marketing trendsetters. Um, we know they've taken social media by storm as for well. Sure, sure. So they're a club, they're a club on, 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 on the way. They're a they're club on the up but uh, still a way to go. Mm. And uh, Benny McCarthy, how far can he inspire the team? Uh, because initially when he came in, I remember reading your article, Rodney, uh, reminiscing about the good old days with Benny McCarthy the first time he played uh, football in South Africa. How far can he... There were doubts as well in terms of uh, whether or not he will be a good coach. Remember that prior to that, he had been in Belgium as an assistant coach. There was no coaching experience. However, now he's won a trophy. He, he, he's still in the running to win the league. How far, Clint, can he, can he take this team? Yes, I, I think when Benny arrived, I think a lot of us uh, in Cape Town thought it was a marketing tactic. For sure, for sure. Um, as in, we'll fill the stadium, not because of the football, but because we've got uh, the golden boy of South African football who happens to be from Cape Town, mm -hmm. uh, come back to do good. Um, I, the, the story goes, and whether this is true or not, is, is when City needed a coach, uh, John Kamenez ca called everyone in uh, to his office and said, who do you bring here? Who excites the city? Um, and I believe one of the tea ladies said, Benny McCarthy, <laughs> and everyone laughed, like you laughing right now. And then someone said, hold on a second, uh, that's not maybe a bad idea. And, and so um, uh, the story goes, and he, and he came, and, and at first I wasn't sure how he was going to do either. But what he has shown is that uh, he's got the licenses, so he's mm. got the, uh, the education, he's been there and done that. Um, he's been coached by some of the best coaches in the world, so um, he's been coached by Mourinho. So there has to be lessons that you learn as a player from those people that you can then come and uh, instill. Um, I believe he's been linked with Bafana Bafana and Pirates and, and everyone's going, well, he, he goes to a big club from here. I think he needs to stay here as long as he can, keep cutting his teeth. I think what they have done is they've bought very well, so they don't spend as much money as Chiefs and Pirates and Sunons. 
But if you uh, if you buy the right players and you put them in the right system, you don't need to to spend as much money. Um, and it's uh, it's been a godsend to Cape Town football to have a team that's uh, that's competing. Yeah, Rodney, as a journalist, yeah, we, you've you've followed a lot of what he's been doing. I've seen you at the Cape Town Stadium. You've spoken to him a lot. Your impression of him? Yeah, look, I know Benny very well from when he was a when he was a young teenager sure. and he used to come into the dressing room when I was playing at Santos because his brother played with me. So when he was a little kid and he used to come in the dressing room and come and have a chat to us after the game. But if there's one thing I can tell you about Benny McCarthy, and he will tell you this himself, he's a winner. It's the, he, he doesn't lack for confidence. He's never short of confidence. He believes in himself a hundredfold. And that's the one thing I think that stands him in good stead as a coach. The fact that in his head, he's a winner. Mm, coach, last one from you. Uh, as we wrap up the show, we have less than a minute. From uh, from a Cape Town City perspective and Benny McCarthy, how far can he take them? Clint mentions that he's being linked um, with the big sides. Do you think that it would be a good idea for him to go or stay? No, I think I think Benny should stay. I think he's, you know, the thing I like about Benny is I've spoken to him many occasions and, uh, you know, I bump into me when I was doing some games on the TV. And, you know, he's not, he wants to learn all the time. You know, he asks the questions. He wants to learn. He doesn't pretend he knows it all. Mm. He knows he's really serving a bit of an apprenticeship now because, he, you know, but he's done really well. And I think I think the nice thing about Benny is that he knows exactly where his space is. He knows what he can do. He knows what he's capable of. He's very confident in what he's doing. And I think he should he should stay uh, he should stay here. Forget about going to these big clubs because it can be ruthless up there. You know you you already learn how to handle certain things, mm. which he's going to still learn. So certain things haven't happened in his career yet that he's going to have to be able to cope with some way or another. And those things haven't happened, but they're going to happen somewhere along the line. Something's going to happen, and he's going to learn how to deal with it. So I think uh, well done to him and his Super Sport team. I think he's uh, he's doing a fantastic job and I wish him all the best and also Cape Town City. All right. Thank you very much, guys, for listening to us. You had been listening to Sokola Duma Radio Live uh, with Clint Roper, Rodney Reiners and four-time Absa Premiership winning coach, uh, Coach Gordon Eggerson. We thank you very much for your time, Coach. There are fixtures in the Absa Premiership. Uh, Marisbeck United tonight are playing against Blomfontein Celtic. Bitvis first, as we spoke about, play Orlando Pirates tomorrow. Uh, Golden Arrows in Cape Town City tomorrow at 3. And Kaza Chiefs at 6 p.m. play Baroka and at uh, quarter past 8 on Saturday, Amazon will host uh, Cheaper United. And then the only one fixture on Sunday will be uh, Black Leopards traveling to uh, Polokwane City. So thank you very much for being with us. Uh, tune in to Sokola Duma Radio on the Sokola Duma website. Uh, we also have our own tabs under more and you can click on our, uh, on our, our podcast and download them to listen to them at your own time. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Sokala Duma Radio. Sokala Duma Radio.